All right. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for everyone for, for coming out to, to be here. That's great. Um, all right. Uh, everything sounded right. There's my kind of my introduction. This is me. We kind of play one of these is like not like the other one slide. <laughs> so uh, my time in Cedar City was at a long-term residential treatment facility, and uh, they had the girls raise baby calves. Um, it's kind of a attachment exercise, and every now and then those cows needed to be straddled and, and moved around and pushed <laughs> here and there. So I, I got to get my hands dirty just like, just like the girls did. Um, so uh, today though, uh, as we talk about this, I want to focus more on my, my research um, exploits, some of the things that I have been doing in the past, um, and then um, focus a bit on one particular study, and then talk a bit about my, my plan from there. So. Um, as was mentioned, uh, my go-to, my, my area of, of strongest interest is co-parenting um, in the context of divorce. The co-parenting literature is, is broader than that, and there's a lot of um, other co-parenting discussion that goes on. I'm particularly interested in divorced co-parents. This comes from a clinical interest, um, you know, really starting from my time here in Provo, but then especially at UConn, working in the room with divorced couples who are trying to figure things out, or were forced to figure things out um, for the best interests of their kids, um, just became an area that I, I enjoyed being in the room with such chaotic couples. But then there was a lot of research that needs to be done that has a lot of real world application to people who are going through these struggles right now. Um, so this is just uh, this is some of the major things that I've done. Um, those top three are um, peer-reviewed, published articles. Um, these two are in that handbook. I swept all of the divorce chapters, so they wanted a chapter <laughs> on divorced couples, and so I got that one. And then they <laughs> came back and asked me to do a chapter on working with children of divorced parents, and so we took that one as well. Um, the couples one I'm particularly pleased with, we brought a couple of our master's students at UCM in on that and they got some experience working on that as well. Um, and then I just have a couple um, extra things. Um, these are, they have been presented at conferences but they represent some of the direction we'll go um, in the future and I'll talk about that at the end. Um, the second column is, uh, you know, this is kind of my what column and that's kind of my so what column. Um, the, the things that I'm doing, that, that I, skills that I bring to the, to the table. So we've been using actor-partner interdependence models, we've been doing mixed methods work, longitudinal data sets. Um, you know, with this handbook, I'm hopefully building a reputation as the divorce, marriage, and family therapy guy, um, someone that can be a resource and, and connect with people as well. Um, I also have a strain of the work um, that I do that focuses more on therapy process. Um, these interact sometimes, uh, the divorce and therapy process. Um, but I've done things, uh, planned missingness. I have a, an article that got published in, in JMFT on that. Um, using that, we'll talk a bit about it with my, with my project if it's, a, if it's a new subject for anyone. Um, but really, you know, my goal there is to take some advanced statistical methods and again apply them. You know, I'm, I'm very interested in how we can use our research to make things easier for clinicians, to make things better for clients, to make things better for divorced families. And so that's, that's been a major strain of what I'm doing. Um, again, there's some advanced statistics going on in here. We're doing, you know, two intercept, two level models in, in HLM and that type of stuff. I do then just want to take one second and highlight um, as the research director at Discovery Ranch for Girls. Um, again, just a, a shaping experience for me as a therapist, but also as a researcher. Um, one of the, the major products that came out of that um, was this. So I get to, I like to show this off. Um, this is a report that uh, I, so I work in R and this is an HTML report that I convinced R to generate for me. So what we would do, would do is every month we would um, collect outcomes for the students and then I would set R a running on it 
and it would output this so that we could share it right with the therapist, we would use it in our treatment team meetings, we would share it with the students and with their parents. Um, and it ended up just being a really, you know, a great representation, again, of what I'm going for, where we can use these cutting edge ideas, feedback informed treatment, like is going on in the clinic here, and bring it to new places, right, in the ranch, um, in other places, um, and again, to just make things better for folks. Uh, again, this was, a, this was quite the project to convince R to, to do all of that, but it, it also shows the power of, of that and the, the things that I can do. So pointing to the idea of, of problem solving, it's one of my, my favorite things to do in the research process is to say, what should the analysis be or what should we be able to do? And then to find the right method and connect it with that. So to dive in a bit more into that, um, I wanna highlight, um, this was my dissertation research. I've published one paper off of it and I have two more in preparation that I'm working on based on it. So I'd like to, to spend a bit of time diving in, talking through some of the, the thoughts here, um, what was going on with it. The, the major focus, the, the place to start, or the kind of our mooring for this, is, is around this idea of parental alienation. Um, if anyone's familiar with the Reveal podcast, it's an investigative journalism podcast, they uh, just did a really, uh, just last week, did a really neat show about parental alienation. Um, and it was, it was this neat reminder for me for the, the stakes that are playing out in, um, in this topic. A lot of the original thinking or kind of the, the publicity around it made the case that when a child is rejecting a parent, uh, the, though the proponents of parental alienation syndrome would say that the only reason a child would do that is because the other parent is pushing them, is forcing them, or is denigrating that other parent, okay? Um, in response to some criticism, they would sometimes give a little bit of an allowance for Yes, there may be actual abuse going on there, um, but overall it was a very simplistic um, picture here that if, you know, up to a, and including the fact that the diagnostic criteria was based on the child's response, not the alienator's behavior, right? If the child's rejecting, then it must be alienation. This led to all sorts of um, uh, clinical implications, right, where children would sometimes be removed from the parent they want to be with and put with a, with a parent who has maybe even had substantiated um, reports of abuse. And, and it just gets really dicey. So in response to this, um, some other researchers came along. Kelly and Johnson, 2001, is one of the, the major pieces where they said, hold on, there's likely a whole lot going on here. Um, these two slides are my, you know, you may be a systems thinker if this <laughs> slide is more comfortable for you than this slide is, right? And this, this I can breathe again once, once I see this slide. They pinpointed a couple different things, um, but also suggested, look, there, there may be a whole lot going on in the process of divorce that could lead a child to a child refusing contact with, with their parent. That got formalized. So Friedlander and Walters, um, they're kind of in the same research group, uh, so you'll see these four and a couple others that, that are frequently working together. So they refined this, um, really focused, they still admit or acknowledge that there could be alienation going on, um, but they add other pieces in there. So they talk about enmeshment, right? A child may be so identified with one parent that they just don't want to leave that parent and thus are essentially rejecting the other parent. It could be, they use the term estrangement to say, this other parent may not be great at being a parent. They may not have much warmth. They may not be very responsive to the child and the child could very naturally just not want to, to be with that parent. Um, as far as empirical support <coughs> for this, uh, there's really only one good, um, there, there was only really one good study of it uh, and it came out of that same group, right? So they proposed the theory, they had the data that, that supported that theory. Um, and so that's, that's nice. Uh, one of the reasons I wanted to tackle this was to get some additional support, to provide additional empirical evidence. Um, but then to go beyond that, to, 
again come back to here to say, I wonder if there's some other circles here, some other things that may be going on. Um, so for me, there were just a few things based on the literature that really stood out that, that I wanted to look at and, and test empirically. Um, going, I'm going to go upwards for whatever reason. Um, adolescence is one piece. One of the things that we see, especially in the qualitative work, is that for some adolescents, not all of them, they will reject a parent just as part of their almost normative process of dealing with the, the loss of that relationship. Okay? They may, that part of that may be they blame one parent, but part of it may be that they're confused and just feel like they need to reject someone or blame someone to, to make sense of it. Co-parental conflict is another one. Um, this is a, a thing that we see often in the literature related to child outcomes in general. Um, but a significant piece of it is that the greater conflict we have, the more children are going to feel caught between their parents. They're going to feel these invisible loyalties or this, this need to choose. And then last, and the one that, that I'm most interested in, um, is to actually look at the child response and you know, in a sense, look at how that child engages in a coalition to, to join or become a team with the parent. Uh, this is appealing to me um, because it feels more systemic, right? The children in all of these previous models were these passive recipients of parental behaviors. Um, as we start talking about coalitions and add that into our model, it gives us an opportunity to think about our children, you know, actually participating in that, or are they just these passive recipients? So, to get to some methodology, the, the main study, we did a pilot study that I'll, I'll mention in just a second here. Um, the main study was an online survey of young adults who had been uh, children uh, eight or up at the time of their parents' divorce. So, uh, it's a retrospective study, we asked them to uh, reflect on the environment in that first year following their their divorce um, with two major two major questions right we wanted to understand we wanted to test this model but then also to look a bit at how they are doing now to see if these things that we're talking about have you know long-term effects what the research suggests is that for some of this more naturally occurring contact refusal, uh, that often dissipates on its own, whereas parental alienation or sort of this forced rejection oftentimes leads to ongoing struggles, ongoing difficulties. So um, my sample was not, you know, not as great as I would want it to be, but it, it gave us a good place to start. The major thing is that the vast majority of them had custody with their, were primarily in the, the presence of their moms. And so that's, that's going to be something that we're going to note here because that coalition with mother is going to stand out a lot in the analysis. Uh, we're not able yet with this data set to unpack if that's about being the residential parent or if that's about something specific to mothers. So that's, that's something to play with in the future. One of the pieces of this then was to advance our, our measures and look at some things um, that, that we didn't have, have measures for. So we, we used a pilot study to develop a, a scale of contact refusal and also the scale to, to measure um, the parental co coalition. Um, here's everyone's favorite slide of any research presentation, right? Is <laughs> there's all the measures we used. I won't spend too, too long here, um, but we tried to, tried to get at things from a, a variety of standpoints. Baker, incidentally, is um, one of the major research proponents of the parental alienation syndrome side of things, um, and she thankfully has a, a really nice survey to, to ask about a lot of those behaviors. Um, but then, again, it's this contact refusal scale and the parental coalition scale that I developed myself. Um, have pretty good psychometrics. This is the CFA, conformatory factor analysis, that we did with that. Um, these, are, these are kind of trimmed stems, but it gives you a sense of what we're, what we're asking about, right? So, wished you didn't have to see that parent, found an excuse to not do something with that parent, 
ignored contact, you know, told others you do not like that parent. So this can range from absolutely not wanting to be with that parent to, you know, just not really liking them. And one of the things, you know, kind of a light mixed methods approach to that um, is that we ask them as we got that, those descriptions to tell us what they were like. Um, for mothers, it was pretty straightforward, except for this one. You know, this is my, I'm not sure what was going on there. Um, but otherwise, right, at a low score, lived with my mother, standard mother-son teenage relationship. You know, <coughs> at a 6.42, oh geez, I hated my mom, honestly. You know, we get some nice face validity there where it's, where it's kind of matching. The fathers is the interesting thing where uh, I think it validates my measure, but it represents some additional complexity that we're going to have to work with in the future. Because the measure, as I assess it, does a good job of assessing whether the child was refusing contact, but it does not measure whether they were actually having contact with their fathers. Because some fathers split, some fathers leave. Um, so our score of one, Right? He stopped talking to my siblings and I. They contacted him on and off a few times, but he never seemed very interested in any of us. The child's not refusing contact, but he's not having any contact either. And so there's this really interesting gender dynamic going on here that is another one of those things just generating from developing the measure that we're going to need to look at um, and, and sort through in the future as well. The one other thing to, to note here um, is that we used a planned missing data approach as we collected this. If you think back to that measure slide, uh, there were a lot of measures and I had no faith that people were going to get through all, I don't know how many it would be, like 200 items um, by the time they were done with my survey. So we actually used a fairly aggressive planned missingness design um, as a review or a a brief introduction to that. Uh, what we did is we divided the different measures into um, sets and then each person got what we call the X set which includes the contact refusal scale because that's our dependent variable and the demographics because we need to know that. They got those plus a couple of the other measures. Okay, So they may, forget, forgive the uh, flying through here, they may have just got you know, this measuring of co-parenting and the Baker strategy scale and not answered the other things. Scott, can you do that with 292 with an N of 292? Uh, I've always thought that you needed a much bigger data set to do planned missing. Uh, I, things worked out and <laughs> I, I, never found, I never found anything that, that dissuaded me from that. Uh, <coughs> the understanding, the rule of thumb that, that I was told is that each one of, we need, we should have at least about 30 uh, data points for each correlation essentially, right? As we're, we're making a correlation matrix. And if you think of um, structural equation modeling, you know, you can run your structural equation model just from a covariance matrix. And so you can, as you're con constructing that matrix, if each one of those is sufficiently powered, then you should be good to go, kind of a rule of thumb wise. So that was, that was the impression that I was given um, as, I, as I was researching it, as I was making sense of it. And I did not get gobbledygook on the, the other side, so I feel reasonable about it. Right. Other questions on plan missingness? No? Um, we had, just to answer the question, Again, we, we had done some stuff with planned missingness on clinical data sets as well. And so that, that was another piece where we were able to, we created our own planned missingness. And I'm no master of simulated data or anything like that. But um, again, had given us some confidence that, that we would be able to reconstruct those relationships. Um, the, we used, for some of our analyses, we used multiple imputation. In those cases, we would impute 50 data sets um, that we would then run our, our data on. Um, and then we have a few where we were doing structural equation modeling and we just used full information. Maximum likelihood within the, 
the Levan package. Um, again, I do pretty much all my analyses in R. Um, and so Levan is, is my go-to there. Um, any questions methodology-wise before we go to chat about some result, results? I guess we'll have a chance for questions at the end, too. Uh, okay, so the first thing we did was we basically replicated that earlier empirical test um, that Johnston and her colleagues had done. Um, we put in those key pieces and we um, added the, the extra pieces that I was, that we were interested in, the, the extra factors. Um, what you'll see here, so if we just take start of the, the p-values, uh, you'll see that violence comes through as an important thing. Again, that abuse factor matters. Uh, this, again, is rejecting contact with the father. And then the father's warmth matters. So that verifies the, the estrangement val variable. If fathers are more or less warm, the child is more likely to want to, to be with that parent. But then the, the other piece, right, is that the idea of that coalition with the mother. Okay, when we're measuring that coalition, you'll see, does that, yeah, right there, that the alienating behavior drops out entirely. Not only that, so we, uh, I, I have to mention this because it was a Herculean effort, I think. Um, I had to, we had to calculate these. I had to write my own function in R to make this happen. Um, but we calculated uh, partial R squared for each of the, the variables. You know, essentially what that is doing is just saying, if we run this model without that variable versus with that variable, how much is R squared affected? And so it can give us a, a measure of effect size or, or relative importance is, is how it gets referred to more often. Scott. Yes. Could you please, for those of us who aren't clinicians, uh, yes. help us understand the difference between being in a coalition with the mother while as different from mother alienating behaviors? I mean, I, I kind of understand both of them having, well, I understand both of them, but couldn't they be co-occurring? Uh, co uh, yes, they certainly could be, and we're going to run a mediation model in just a moment oh, here. Great. So, I love mediation models. Yeah. Um, the idea is, so the mother alienating behaviors, um, and, and you'll, you'll see that I, I have to be persnickety in my language there, because these are things that the mother is doing towards the child. So that may be things like as simple as referring to the father, we'll, we'll use the mother alienating behaviors, referring to the father by his first name, okay? Simple, low, low key things, or maybe complaining or rolling her eyes when, when the father is mentioned. Or calling uh, that man. Or that man, yes, Rather those type of things. Father. All the way up, and then, you know, that goes up the scale to, you know, telling the child to, that he is a terrible person, telling them that he was abusive, or refusing to allow the child to see that parent. Okay, so those are going to be those parent behaviors. The coalition is going to be uh, from the child's, the respondent's perspective. Uh, I, I mostly, the kind of key question there is to what extent did you feel like you were on a team with this parent against the other parent? Okay, right. so yes, they're going to go very quickly, you know, together. If the child receives those alienating behaviors and starts saying, yes, it's me and mom against dad, that's going to be the coalition. Okay, so yes, they, they interact very much. Um, so yeah, just last point there is that on that relative importance measure, it's that coalition that comes through very strongly. Um, on mothers, we have a similar story. There's some extra factors there. Um, again, the coalition is not only significant, but the most, rel most important, right? Has that highest partial R squared. Um, in this case, alienating behavior does have a direct effect. Um, and this is the one place where adolescence comes through. So chill, agreeing with that, that kind of the qualitative stuff we had seen, where children who were adolescents were more likely, again, only so much. It did not explain a lot of the variance, but there was a statistically significant effect where they more, were more likely to reject mom. 
the, the older they were, the more likely they were doing that? Yes, we just did this binary where if they were 13 to 17, they were adolescents. If they were younger, then they weren't. And so if they were adolescents, they were more likely to reject mom, you controlling for everything else. This, but just as you think about it, having worked with these families a lot, mm -hmm. what part of that is just the need and ability to be independent? Mm -hmm. Right. I, I have to. I have to make some decisions contrary to my mom anyway, whether we're intact or divorced. Right. Yes. I do not have the data on that. Does it feel like that though? Uh, that's how I conceptualize it, and that's, um, you know, Wallerstein and Kelly, um, back in the '70s, did a lot of qualitative work on this, and that's how they kind of make sense of it. Is that the, as part of that individuation process, as part of that, maybe not having their full cognitive abilities yet to to be in the gray zone, they, they reject to assert themselves to be independent. So, did you ever look yes. at just mean scores and coalition with mother for the kid? Did it drop as they got older? Uh, I do not know the answer offhand. Okay. I can, even just looking at the co correlation coefficient, we could look at that. Okay, thank you. But, yeah. Um, so as foreshadowed earlier, uh, given that uh, alienating behaviors fell out of the model, especially with fathers, um, and just given the importance and kind of that systemic effect of coalitions, um, we wanted to do a, a mediation model here as well, where we, you know, we modeled all of the direct effects still for these items, but then asked to what extent do those encourage children into a coalition. So the way this is set up this we ran the model separate for mothers and fathers just two two separate models and these are the results for contact refusal of the father so you you kind of have to sort through who's doing the alienating and who's doing what these are the results for the mothers and so what we find okay uh, our direct effects hold out pretty well they're they're still basically the same um, it's that that a this is where the alienating behavior comes through, right? So we see an indirect path from alienating behaviors to coalitions and then from coalitions to contact refusal. The other piece though, um, and again this is one of those places where we need to appreciate that more often they are with mom, so we, it's hard to make this about moms and dads, it may be about residential versus non-residential parents. Um, there's a protective effect here for moms. Okay, when mom's warmth was high, children were much less likely to engage in contract refusal. They were less likely to, to buy into that. Um, and so this, you know, this just right here is one of those things um, I used to teach do parent education for divorced parents. This was one where it's like, here is something we can go to right away. Because the, the storyline of parental alienation syndrome is one of powerlessness. Right? And we, they use that to then encourage the court to exert its power to take the child. Here, there's an empowerment that can go on to say, yes, these alienating behaviors may be affecting your, your relationship with that child, and you have an opportunity there as well. As we work towards being more warm, more responsive as a parent, you know, children can assess the truth is, is kind of how I would would suggest that, that if they're being told things and they say, this doesn't fit, mom seems really nice, they're, they're going to, to sort through that. Hey, no, <coughs> no worries. Okay. Um, so that was, that was the main look around this idea of contact refusal. But so then I wanted to do some extra stuff, right, because we were talking to young adults. Uh, again, this is retrospective data, but we were able to, to maybe find some suggestions about what's going on, what are the, the long-term sequelae of, of this whole process. Uh, so what we did, um, we had a few different dimensions that we looked at. In this case, we did, these are all regressions using multiple imputation. Um, we looked at their current relationship with their mom and dad. So this is conflict on the next one is going to be the depth of their relationship. And then we also looked at the young adult, the participant's current functioning. What we find here, so with fathers, that coalition with the mother has an ongoing effect. 
okay, and a relatively strong one according to that partial R squared, that having been in a coalition with mom continues to make it hard to be in a relationship with dad. It's encouraging conflict there. Um, father violence is also an effect, right? If father was violent around the time of the divorce, the children are going to continue to struggle with him. Notably, uh, the nothing comes through for mothers, okay? And if you look at the, the R squareds for the whole model, uh, this is around 0.5, this is like 0.2 or 0.3 for the moms. The way I interpret that is that for moms, the, the history perhaps does not matter in the same way that it's, it's, I would assume it's more about the ongoing relationship, what things are going on now. Again, recognizing that these were also generally the, the um, residential parents. Uh, the same uh, or a similar story as we look at relationship depth, except here, uh, the only thing that comes, nothing comes through for moms, again. Here, in this case, the only thing that matters is that warmth, okay? That as fa if fathers were warm and supportive around the time of the divorce, children are able to have an ongoing, deep relationship with them. Last but not least on this, um, I asked some questions. So we asked, these are four different analyses, but all scrunched together, so I don't have to fly through slides. Uh, we asked about current depressive symptoms, current anxious symptoms, um, current avoidant attachment, current anxious attachment, and then ran it with these various things that they were experiencing. Okay, so we separated the parental coalitions out, but for many of these, you know, we would combine the parental alienating behaviors and just ask, like, to what extent were you exposed to alienating behaviors? What came, comes through, you'll see we have a pattern on all three of them, or on, across, across the board, is that those coalitions continue to be negative, okay? Being, having been on a team with one parent against the other parent um, is associated with these later problems. Again, it's retrospective data, There's, it's correlational here. Um, so we, we don't know but what they remember it differently or, or whatever's going on. Um, but then the other piece is that that combined warmth, the amount of warmth that they experienced in that process of divorce serves as a protective factor for three of these, not the depressive symptoms, okay? And so again, I, I, I really like this study um, because of those practical implications. This is something that, that gives us a lot to work with, a lot of valuable information that we can share with families about the complexity here, okay? The, the court system can go to really simple, uh, you know, just blanket actions. And the reality is, is that just like Kelly and Johnston suggested, just as systems theory would suggest, there's a lot of interactive patterns, there's a lot of different things that are going on that we need to keep track of, okay? I'm convinced that as we go even deeper here, we're going to find more and more of those and, and be able to, to understand this better uh, in the future. And that is my segue to the future, okay? So as I think about this research that I've done um, and where I would like to go, um, it falls along a, a couple paths that I, I hope are not too unexpected. Um, first and foremost, based on, on this, the, the project that I'm itching to, to have the time and availability to do is to go in and essentially redo this study right, as it were. I think the, the study is valuable, but I also perceive it as a, as a pilot study. This was, this was a time to, to test things out and get some ideas, and we wanna, I wanna dive in um, and work with families who are in the midst of, of divorce, right? To go through you know, divorce records and contact people so that we have an actual random sample. We're able to, to get people in that moment and ask those questions, right? Um, in this process, I'm very much going to look for collaboration with adolescence researchers because my, my interest is typically on the, the parent side of things, the co-parenting side of things, um, but there's going to be all sorts of great qualitative and quantitative things that we're able to do while we're working there with those, those adolescents as well. Um, a couple other things that are on my docket. This first slide 
is kind of my, my year one slide, like what I, what I would love to do right out the gate, kind of things that I have just sitting, looking for the, the opportunity to, to work on. Um, I have formed re relationships with residential treatment facilities here. Um, I have um, Brett Talbert of um, Scent Companies. Uh, he's hounding me, saying, here's my data. Please analyze it for me. Um, we want to look at alliance um, scores, looking at that within system alliance as a feedback informed treatment approach to predict uh, early termination from, from treatment. And so that's something not going to be the most, it's not going to be a super sophisticated, difficult thing to, to run, but could potentially really help a lot of kids in, in residential treatment. Um, methods wise, um, the places that I want to be going and developing um, are uh, these ones here. So uh, I've identified that my next place to go is latent class and latent profile analysis. Um, as we, we've done a little bit of work in the past on looking at dyadic trajectories of alliances. Okay, we can, we can make easy predictions where if someone comes in with a good alliance with their therapist, they're going to do better. Okay, we've, we've demonstrated that. But how do we work with split alliances? How do we work with when one partner's getting better and one's getting worse? We have fought hard and long on a way to conceptualize that and put it into uh, an HLM model, put it into different types of models. And um, where I've recognized, um, I think the power and the, the ability to do that is going to come from is from that um, latent class or profile analysis. And so that's an area that I'm, I want to develop, I want to collaborate um, so that we can keep pushing some of those therapeutic issues forward. And the other one that I got training on, so I went through a training in it, and I'm just, again, looking for the, the opportunity, because I'm sure it's going to open all sorts of opportunities, um, is the uh, quantitative text analysis, right? This is the, the idea that we can look um, sometimes as simple as, as the pronouns that people are using, right? The idea of, are people using I pronouns versus using we pronouns? Um, there's already some really neat research about that. I would love to bring that over into the clinical focus, okay? You know, I kind of have this running hypothesis that in successful therapy, you're going to see a movement from I statements at the, the start of therapy to we statements at the end of therapy. It could become a really neat outcome measure that potentially is, gets us past symptoms and maybe to some level of depth. Um, similarly, you can do sentiment analysis. Um, I already have data lined up from my, my colleague at UCM is a divorce researcher, but she approaches it qualitatively. And so um, we, she has interviews, she has people she's worked with where to go and look at the sentiment there and how that's associated with divorce adjustment, um, those, type of, those type of questions. So those are ones that out of the gate, I just need that opportunity to be at a, at a research institution rather than a teaching institution. The, uh, one correction I needed to make to my introduction was that it was only five months, not a year after I got there, that I became program director. Right? Um, <laughs> well, at least they gave you some time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, got to, I got to settle in, settle in and learn the landscape a lot. Um, you know, and that's uh, one, of the, one of the acknowledgments that, that I make is that I have work to do, I have places I want to be, and um, it's been been difficult to be productive over the past couple of years, but I'm excited for those, those opportunities. I love sitting down and working through these things and having these research conversations and producing. As I think about more along the lines of a three to five year plan, where do, what do I want to be doing? Um, I would love to then get deeper um, in co-parenting, um, in looking at those coalitions to do some of that longitudinal work, right? To be able to really verify these again, kind of pilot conclusions that we had, uh, that those coalitions are producing lasting problems for our kids. As much as a parent may feel like, no, I'm keeping them safe and we're buddies, that could be potentially damaging. And then to also take that to a dyadic place, right? To not just talk to the children, um, but to look at at least the child and the caregiver uh, or the guardian, uh, residential parent, um, but hopefully the other one you know, the non-residential parent as well. And to try and really understand some of those things and, and, and make some movement there, right? Because these are, 
the, the interesting thing about divorce is, you know, it's, it's still happening, right? There's a lot going on and there's a lot of people in the court system muddling through that process um, that I think are really receptive and open to good quality information. We just need to, we need to do it. We need to find that. Um, the other major piece that I would love to go towards um, is the combination of these kind of two different lines of, of research, is to start to understand divorce treatment in more significant ways. Um, I'm a big proponent of um, what in therapy we call the common factors approach, which looks less at our interventions, less at the specific skills, and more at the, the circumstances, um, things like the relationships that go on in therapy. The thing about divorce therapy is that a lot of those assumptions are flipped on their head or need to be tweaked and understood in a different way. Where in, you know, especially in individual therapy, an alliance with your client is really straightforward and, and easy. When you have two people in the room who literally hate each other and would be happy if the other was dead, you know, what, how do we work with that? How do we make sense of it when can I form a relationship with one without harming my relationship with the other? What does that look like and how do we work with that? Therapists, in my experience, are hungry for that information because, again, they're working with these, these folks but do not have a lot of guidance, do not have a lot of um, opportunities or ways to think about it. Within that, we're going to need plenty of measures. And you know, measure development is one of those fun things that I really like to do um, because we did a bit of work looking at standard measures of the alliance, and they just fall apart when you're looking at divorced families. They, we don't know who they're talking about. Are they talking about their new spouse? Are they talking about the ex-spouse? Or do they just refuse to do it because they hate it? It's the whole, the whole measure place is a lot that we need to work through. And then last but not least, um, I've just been thinking a lot in connection with residential treatment, um, um, but looking at the, the feedback informed treatment movement. Um, there's some really great proponents and, and people pushing for things out there. And I think that I have a lot of ideas and questions around optimizing that. Um, we have some cool projects out there, and I wonder if we can do things more simply, or what are those things that are actually important to look at? Again, in the case of divorce, um, we just had a poster that will develop into a, a paper um, on how you need a different outcome measure than our standard feedback-informed treatment measures when you're working with a divorced family. Because they could be doing great in every aspect of their life, but still be terrible co-parents. And so we need, to, we need to advance the science. We need to have those tools and those measures. All right. I think that puts me right about on schedule where I'm Very supposed good. to be to uh, open it up for questions. Yeah? So maybe you already said this, Scott, and if you did, I apologize, but mm -hmm. um, what was the average length of time since the participants in your study uh, experienced the divorce? Um, so how, I guess I'm asking how retrospective, I mean, you've addressed that you would like to do this where they're yes. in the process, right? So you understand the fundamental issues. I'm just curious, what's the... I How thought I had it on there. Average age at separation okay, was right. 11, and now average age is 25.1. So about 13 years. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yep. Yes. Um, so your, your proposed research on using like the textual analysis uh -huh. is really innovative, and I think it's really exciting. Oh. Um, and I'm I, excited, I, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> question, though, um, so I'm not a therapist, so this may be totally wrong. But I thought that you were supposed to encourage I statements <coughs> during therapy. So would it instead move from maybe like a U to an I in a we instead of an I to a we? Or I love some thoughts on it. It could be, right? There's there's all sorts of there's all sorts of directions you could go, right? From a fundamental piece, right? We want an I statement to avoid a blaming you statement. Right. We want people to acknowledge their own feelings and what's what's going on there. Um, I would suggest, I haven't thought this part through well enough, but I would accept a we statement as long as they're not misrepresenting the other person. So there's, there's going to be some complexity there. Right? We could almost think of like a stage model where maybe they come in at you, move to I, move to we. I don't know. There's, there's an elegance to that. It's also going to depend on the, the model because some of that communication is going to be focused on the exact like I, this, where a lot of models aren't. Is it, is it 
big on that. Mm-hmm. So it could depend on the therapist too. Mm-hmm. And the in context. The, in the marital, what's, what's the name of the interview? Marital history interview, oral history interview. Um, one of the things, one of the scales is the weenus scale, and you want them to be higher on weenus. Um, <laughs> I, I wasn't going to be the one that said weenus first. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so, so you want higher we language. <laughs> for, for me, like I think, what it speaks to is, as I think about it, there's a lot, there's a lot more room for research questions than for hypotheses. You know, there's some hypotheses we can make, but I just think, I think it's so interesting, uh, even just in the uh, sample, the samples you did. This it wasn't therapy or even family studies specific. You know, they had us looking at presidential inaugurations. It's like, well, that's fine stuff. You know, it's like there's such a wealth of information that you can draw out with that textual analysis. And, and aren't those, uh, and those are unobtrusive measures, which uh-huh. can often be much uh, more revealing. Yeah. Uh, and get out of some, some of the social biases and, and things like that. With, if, if, if you're analyzing just their language, I, I can imagine it being really quite revealing. Yeah, right. You know, I would love this is reasonably sure it's impossible, but it would be nice to even have a report on that at the end of your session. Use that as a feedback informed treatment uh-huh. where you get back this report on here was the dominant sentiment, here was the dominant pronoun usage <laughs> in that session, and we could use that as feedback for, for the therapy. You know? Yeah? There is a guy out of forgetting his name, but I was at the University of Texas who just studies couple interactions, and, it, it, and he found the more often the word you shows up, the less healthy the relationship. I mean, that word by itself, just mm-hmm. general interactions. Yeah. Not mm-hmm. right, so. There, that one, that one validated you. Yeah. So you're, you're on that. You're on well, Sarah, you are yeah. sitting on therapist's row. So <laughs> <laughs> We're a little confused. So. <laughs> Sarah's thinking jumping ship. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I, I just see it, there's, there's such an opportunity there when I learned about it, you know. I'm, I'm one of those quant guys that can also really appreciate the qualitative side of things, and, and I think this is how I can pretend to have some qualitative depth to me as well, and, and play around in transcripts and stuff. And stuff. So a question yeah. I have going back to uh, co-parenting with divorced yes. parents is, um, in some families you're obviously going to have multiple children that uh-huh. are involved in divorce at different developmental stages. So a question being, uh, how, how do we examine the effect um, for children at different developmental periods, I guess, or different developmental stages as they go through this experience, and how does that then impact you know, their experience with parents later in life? So. Uh, right. Yes. I know it's a lot. It's, that, it's a big one, right? And, and so I think that's a little what I'm getting at with the, the adolescence piece. Is, right. Um, because one of the interesting things, I don't know that I... I, I don't think I said this as, as I was going. Uh, what Wallerstein and Kelly had suggested is that the only times that non-adolescents rejected parents in their, in their study was when it was a case of when there was pressure to do so, some level of alienating behaviors. Maybe not a full-blown alienation campaign. But yes, for those younger kids, that it was always a response to parental behavior. Whereas for adolescents, there's, it's much more about that, that other stuff, right? That they, they are going through their, their own process. So yes, I think just from an individual child looking at the developmental level, I think there's a, a lot to do that's, again, beyond probably my expertise in, in child development and human development that, that I think is ripe for, for looking at. You know, beyond that is asking those questions around siblings, right? That do, what's the configuration? I have no doubt that we have some cases where one child is going to reject and one is not going to. How does that interact? Again, that's quantitatively, that can get really messy. And that may be another area. I'm, I'm convinced that latent profile analysis is going to solve all of my data problems in the future. Um, <laughs> uh, 
No, but that, that, that there must be some way to, to get at some of that and look at how that works at a bigger than just individual or even dyadic, a whole family system <coughs> level. So yes, I 100% agree that that sounds fascinating to, to look at. Other questions. Do do you have interests in um, in uh, divorce slash co-parenting education? Um, do do you think in those terms as well as the uh, clinical terms? Um. Yes. I, I, yeah. I mean, I provided divorce parent education. I, I have an interest there. I regularly critique the literature for being too focused on satisfaction scores rather than actually determining whether whether people are changing their behaviors. So it's it's totally something that I would be I would love to to get involved with. I think my mind tends towards the intervention side. You know, I'm at the end of the day a therapist and that's that's I think what what I focus on the most. Um, but the answer is yes, I think there's a lot of opportunity for for doing that. I you know I, I always go to the complexity and wanting to like dig through with individual families and, and tailor things. And so that's whenever I get to parent education, it's like, okay, how can we capture some of that but make it systematized enough that we may have a bachelor's or master's level person just providing this in a, that's not able to go into the, the therapeutic side of it. So the answer is so yes. And there's, new, there's so much nuance to it that I, I struggle a bit with with how do we even approach that? How do we get at from a this is a broad level? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. What do you enjoy teaching the most when you think about undergrads and graduate students? What do you what are the topics and areas that you're most excited about? Um, I really like so I enjoy uh, teaching theory. Um, theory classes are are really fun to me. I, I love when I can do that. So right now it, with the undergraduates, I do, it's like a intro to helping relationships, um, helping skills class. And it, it captures it really well because we do the introductory marriage and family therapy. We introduce them to the marriage and family therapy models. Um, but then we also get to be really practical. So I, I love the heavy theoretical side of things. And then I love bringing it down and say, Let's do this. Let's let's learn how to actually do that. So, um, anything that that it can be more hands-on, where we can be doing role plays, where we can be doing those type of things, or that are super abstract and we're just kind of arguing about the meaning of <laughs> specific words. That's my favorite, my favorite area to be. Um, I'm really adaptable. Uh, I I have fun in whatever I'm teaching. So, I teach adolescent development for us now, and you know it may not have been my first pick. Uh, but we have a great time, um, and I think it's really valuable for the students as we, unfortunately, at least with teenage girls, I have a lot of experience um, with some of the, the more dysfunctional side of things, um, but we, again, take it to theory, take it to intervention. Um, we talk a lot about culture within there. I enjoy uh, doing research stuff as well. I love, I like, I do our research methods class for our master's students. Um, we have a lot of fun in there. I have a lot of fun, at least. I actually tried to teach them R one semester, and it, I had a lot of fun. We'll say I had a lot of fun. <laughs> so I've, I've revised that. I have, yeah, that's an I. We are having, I may say something about my effectiveness in that class at that time. So we, we're revising, we're, we're learning, and um, it's a, it's a, that's a bugger that I'm still working on, is how can we effectively teach these students who, in all honesty, they don't get a lot of research background in their undergraduate, often at UCM, because we're a smaller university that's not as research focused. How can we give them a meaningful experience in that research methods class and take it and become better you know, practitioners, better science, scientist practitioners do something there? So I don't know if that answered your question or just danced around the question a whole lot, but those are some thoughts around teaching as well. All right, we have time for maybe one more question. This is a self-report typology question, Scott. Okay. Uh, some of us are here at BYU because we really wanted to come here. 
Uh, some of us are refugee hires, you know, where we were saying, please get me out of here. Uh -huh. And this is where we landed. And there are some of us who were happy where we were at, but colleagues were saying, please get him out of here. Okay. Uh, so which one of those three typologies is <laughs> most likely like? Pretty sure I'm not the third one. Let's, let's, right. let's say that one. I also um, have to stay there alone then. Uh, <laughs> No, so I really enjoy where I'm at. So I, UCM has been a, it's, it's fun. You know, I have, a, I have a lot of fun there. We have great students. It's a different, you know, compared to, I was an undergraduate here at BYU uh, and then a graduate student at UConn. It's a different environment. It's a different feel. It's a fun little university. And so I, I like it there. I'm not beating a hasty path out of there. Um, at the same time, I'm looking for other opportunities as well. Just logistically, this would be really nice to have a mountain that's not 2,000 miles away from us. <laughs> and that, that would be really great for our family activities. Um, but then just the, the opportunities to do, to rebalance things, right? I'm so heavy on the teaching and program directing side of things. It would be uh, really nice to have a, a rebalancing there. I love working with students, um, but I also really like doing research and look forward to doing research more with students. Um, so some, some combination of one and, one and two, I would suggest. I don't, I don't know that I have anyone giving me the boot out there. If, if so, they haven't told me yet. So they may throw a party when I leave, but so I'll report back. So you would start as program director in your first fall semester? I would <laughs> rather, if there's an option not to, I will take that option. <laughs> Jason, Jason just checked. Just let him wait a year or two and then move him on. Give him six months. Yeah. <laughs> well, please join me in giving a hand. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.